Welcome back, Nerglings. Today we're taking a rose-tinted look back at Building a Realms of Chaos Army, Series 3. I will cover what I've achieved this past year, highlight a few lessons learned, and hopefully impart some general hobby tips and tricks too. But before we start, be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. So, what have I achieved this series? I managed to paint or rebase about 100 models this time round, including my Chaos Dwarf contingent, with a baggage train and some fun war machines. I added quite a few interesting monsters and demons to the army, everything from a roaming Jabberwocky to an avalanche of playbearers and associated beasts. Nurglings and greater demons. Of course, I couldn't forget my Pestigore, which you can see me varnishing as I perambulate through this video. To add to the physical side of getting miniatures painted and based, I've also finally decided on an overarching theme for the army, that being Chaos United. By this I mean the inclusion of just about every colour and creed of Chaos in all its forms, the combination of which looks much like the following. A pre-slaughter Chaos Warrior army as the Vanguard, supported by a Chaos Dwarf army and a Beastman army. In addition, there will be a full original demon army comprising of demons from all five Chaos Gods for either summoning or fielding as allies and the like. Let's delve a little more deeply into the structure of the army as I see it. The Chaos Warriors will be predominantly pre-slaughter with supporting characters, chariots, knights and baggage trains. They will also command a barbarian contingent made up of barbarians, thugs, mutants and mutated humans of various guises. The purpose of this army is really to provide a solid core to the main force, something that all the other armies can bolt onto or support in one way or another. It is made up of primarily unaffiliated Chaos Warriors, so I guess you could call them Warriors of Malal or Chaos Undivided. The Barbarians provide some cannon fodder against ranged armies and additional manoeuvre elements to what would otherwise be a rather slow and blocky force, which would be catastrophically vulnerable to ranged weapons and magic. The Chaos Dwarfs are the Siege Masters of the Combined Force. All war machines will be under their command, including everything from the mighty giant Chaos Battering Ram to simple Skaven Weapons teams and Orc Catapults. In addition to the huge firepower provided by cannons, guns and various thrown objects, the Chaos Dwarfs also bring with them a slave army of Orcs and Goblins. This will have Wolf Riders, Slaves, Black Orcs and Archers to provide the solid Chaos Dwarf core of 100 Chaos Dwarfs and attached war machines with flank protection. The Beastman component will simply be a small contingent of Gores and Skirmishing Ungor with a plethora of large monsters and minotaurs. This force is led by a Vermin Lord and will combine beasts from all corners of the Old World including Lizardmen, Skaven, Beastmen and Mutants. This force is not designed to be particularly strategic but more like a hammer to hit the enemy with against the anvil of the Chaos Warriors and Chaos Dwarfs. Each of the Chaos Gods then has a huge demonic army made up primarily of demons but also dedicated worshippers of their chosen deity. For the Nurgle army I will be including Plaguebearers, Nurgle Chaos Warriors, Pestigore, Clan Pestilens, Plague Monks, Plague Zombies, Ghouls and Mushroom Men. They will be assisted in their endeavours by a mixture of beasts and spawn. They will be led to battle by a grand alliance of seven great unclean ones. In the Corn Army I am including noticeably fewer demons and more large creatures and monsters, so this force will have Bloodletters, Corn Chaos Warriors, Corn Gore, Flesh Hounds, maybe some Blood Crushers, however I haven't decided on the form they will take yet. They will be led into battle by Arbor the Undefeated, supported by his lieutenants in the guise of Bloodthirsters and Gargoyles. The Zinch army is modelled on a rainbow of colour and weirdness in equal measure. The main units being blue horrors painted in 16 different colours, Zinch chaos warriors and a square of bird-like warriors with great weapons. They will have a battle rooster, basilisk, various characters on flying discs and no doubt a fair few sorcerers. They will be led by three lords of change, each painted in a primary colour as if they are made up of the base colours of magic. The Slanesh army will be made up of an unholy alliance of demons and dark elves. The army will have demonets, witch elves, harpies, Slanesh, chaos warriors, dark elf bolt throwers, dark elf characters and sorceresses. 
maybe one on a Dark Pegasus as I, I like the model. They will be led by champions of Slanesh on various mounts and of course a keeper of secrets or two. Finally the Malal army will have a force made up of mainly unaffiliated demons and miscellaneous warriors, mostly sourced from the Pantheon of Chaos range but also including various Balrogs and Shadow Dimension creatures. So that's the overarching plan of attack to building what I hope one day may well be one of the most comprehensive collections of Chaos miniatures in the world. Ok, let's have a look at some of the learning points I've developed whilst building this titanic army. Firstly, it has been difficult to maintain consistency in modelling and painting the miniatures, as I've collected the army over half a decade. I've fought the urge to strip old models and repaint them numerous times, and now I've come to the conclusion that if I were to do that, I probably would never get anything truly finished. To that end, I have a real spectrum of painted models. Some of them from earlier efforts with little detail work and just the basics complete, whilst others have fully realised flesh tones and oxidised armour. In addition, I've also had models painted by Baza, Litric and Rochi that are in their signature styles, so having a mix of my own style coupled with theirs makes for a nice effect. Secondly, I seem to waste a lot of varnish. I can't remember the last time I saw the bottom of an army paint a quick shade varnish pot. I invariably need to throw the pot out as it has become opaque and difficult to varnish anything with before I get through the lot. Honestly though I'm not sure how to remedy this situation. I simply varnish things as I go and, and rarely complete more than a dozen or so models each week. If you have any ideas how I could change this then let me know. Thirdly, I seem to have developed a more painterly way of painting my miniatures. I spent years developing hand control and, and detailing through my teens and early twenties before I left the hobby for a time. When I came back I struggled with getting as much detail into the models for a while. Over the last few years I've then started moving over to a more messy way of painting. I can only put this down to somewhat diminishing eyesight and the zeal to simply get stuff done. Also I really enjoyed a comment on one of my photos of my Chaos Army saying quantity is a quality all of its own, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Moving on from lessons learned, I have a few hobby tips. When building a large scale army don't do everything at once, ensure you have a few models to clean, glue, sculpt, paint, varnish and base at any one time. This will give you a variety of hobby tasks to be getting on with, so if you aren't feeling particularly creative you can varnish or base a few models. If you're keen to try a new brush then you have some models ready to be painted. If your planned army is going to be hundreds of models then box three quarters of them up and forget about them whilst you work on a smaller group. This will make what you have to do much more easy to handle both physically and mentally. If you glue everything together all at once and then keep the models on the paint table waiting for some colour you can easily feel overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. This can lead to you to drift off into other hobbies, not want to paint or simply getting disillusioned with the whole project and starting something smaller and more manageable. Don't feel like every model needs to be award winning, unless it specifically needs to be. Keep your mad skills for exceptional sculpts or custom pieces that you are particularly proud of. As I said earlier, quantity is its own quality and you will absolutely understand this when you have a hundred fully painted, varnished and based models neatly ranked up and ready to go, especially if it took you the same time to complete them as it would to do a Golden Demon winning project. Prioritise like a boss. I'm constantly telling staff in my working environment to prioritise their workload and it's just as important to do so with hobbying. If necessary, make a list of things you want to work on every month, week or day and stick to it. With this method you should mix characters, war machines, monsters and troops up liberally so you don't get bogged down with painting dozens of the same thing. Make time to show off completed models. Photograph them and show them in groups to your mates or put them on a blog. Feedback is great and can really help with motivation to start that next unit if you are starting to flag. You can ask for advice, make up a story for the unit or character or simply load them up to a photo sharing site and share them. Anything like this can be a boost. Collect unique miniatures. One of my rules for collecting is never have two of the same model in an army. This means 
No matter how they are arranged for battle, you'll never see the dreaded twin effect that plagues many otherwise fantastic battle scenes in old White Dwarf magazines and is endemic in historical miniature collections. Well, that's just about all I have for you this time round. I hope you gleaned something from this series and this video. Maybe some of you have been inspired to start your own old hammer collection. If you have, please let me know about it below. Remember to comment, like and subscribe, and thanks very much for watching. Peace.